Hi everybody, welcome to another Career Foundry event this evening where I am welcomed by Maureen, who you may have seen on the channel before, but we haven't done an event together for a while. And this evening, we're talking all about design thinking. So if you've got any questions about design thinking, UX design, product design, you're in the right place. Um, I know we've got a lot of people joining this evening, so if you are joining, whack on those emojis on Big Marker. We've got some emojis down there. Show us that you're here, write your name, uh, you know, tell us why you're interested in design thinking or why you're thinking maybe about a career change. Um, I know also we've got a lot of people joining on our YouTube channels. Um, if you've got any specific questions about maybe Career Foundry's curriculum or the programs, we've put a book a call to one of our program advisors. So if you look in the link in the description below, you can book a call uh, to speak to one of our program advisors if you've got any specific questions, because this evening it's going to be a bit more of a general event talking about design thinking. And as I said, we're super, super excited to welcome Maureen back to um, the Career Foundry channel. Maureen is actually a, a Career Foundry graduate, was working at Zalando in Berlin, but has just moved over to uh, Amsterdam and is now working at Miro. So um, she'll explain a lot more about that uh, later in the event. Let me just very uh, briefly introduce Career Foundry before we get going. So Career Foundry is the online school for your career change into tech, and we guide you from complete beginner to job ready professional in UX design and help you land your first job in the field. We're not any old school. Our programs are so flexible that you don't need to quit your day job to change your career. And you get regular one to one mentorship from not one, but two industry experts as a mentor and a tutor. And if you don't land a job within 180 days of graduation, re we refund your tuition in full. So that's our job guarantee. Um, we've also on this page, you can also see that we've uh, won some accreditations too. So we've got some uh, award winning um, symbols that we've just added to the slide. So you can check that out too. But I don't want to talk too much about Career Foundry because this, this evening is all about design thinking. So this event is recorded. I'm going to disappear in, into the background and uh, Maureen is going to present. If you've got any questions, just drop them in the Q&A on the right hand side and um, you will get around to them at the end in the live Q&A. Maureen, um, that's everything from me. I'm going to disappear into the background and um, yeah, call me back at the end. It's over Thank to you. you. Thank you, Will. Yeah, thanks everyone for joining. Um, a little note before I got COVID last week. I'm I'm feeling a bit better, but if I have a random cough or whatever, just know that I'm I'm still trying to get better. <laughs> but I'm still very much looking forward to this webinar. This has been a while that we did this, so maybe feeling a little bit um, crusty. Let's see how we do this tonight. And uh, today we'll talk about design thinking. So where it comes from and what my intentions are with this webinar is to really show you um, all the different kind of perspectives that exist in the industry around design thinking, because there are people that are really big fans of design thinking and that are big believers in it, but there are also designers that are very critical of design thinking. So today I just want to show you these different perspectives and conclude with my view and how I use design thinking or how I don't use it in my work and what that means for you. So I will give a bit of an introduction as well, but this mostly is an, really an invite for you to do some more research. I hope that after this webinar, you feel inspired to read up on design thinking and make your own mind up what you think is valuable. And um, as with all these methodologies go, just uh, take what works for you and leave out what don't, what doesn't work. I think that's always a very um, good approach. These things are not like precise science after all. So uh, Will already introduced me, but very shortly, I started my UX journey in 2017 with Career Foundry. So that's quite a while ago already. Uh, I, st I started even, I think, in November or October 2017. I currently work at Miro as a product designer. Um, we just concluded, yes, indeed, it is pronounced as Miro and not Miro. And formerly, I worked at Zalando, but you might also know me from my Instagram page. I share a bunch of content online in my newsletter on Instagram. Maybe you've seen me in a video of Career Foundry. So I've been on different channels. So um, I already set the stage before a little bit. We'll talk about a hot topic today. 
Um, it will be, become maybe a bit controversial. So please also share your opinions in the chat. I'm always very curious to hear what you think and what you've heard. And um, yeah, just hope that we can have a discussion around this. But before we jump into the actual discussion part, let's first, uh, I first want to tell you a little bit about where design thinking comes from. Because um, design thinking is something that has been around for a long time already. It's something that is not except existing in the last decade, but already the the principles of it could already come up in like the um, 60s, 70s. This idea of working human centered is also not exclusive to design thinking. This approach was there in many different um, ways of designing already. For example, the designers of the Eames chair, in a way you can also say that they designed human-centered, even though they might not have called it design thinking, but the approach was still very similar. But when we talk about design thinking, there's oftentimes one company that is mentioned in the same sentence, and that's IDEO. And IDEO did not invent design thinking, but they definitely popularized it. So they uh, turned this into an actual um, approach or model that can be sold and thought. So Tim Brown, he is part of IDEO, and he defines design thinking as a human-centered approach to innovation that draws from the designer's toolkit to integrate the needs of people, the possibilities of technology, and the requirements of business success. Now, what does that mean exactly? That means that design thinking really happens in the center of what we call desirability, feasibility, and viability. So a good design is something that people actually want, but not just they should not just want it, it should also be able to build it, we should also be able to build it. So it should be technologically possible. And and this is something that um, might be a bit of um, not have enough light on it for designers, but it also need, needs to be viable. So um, whenever you come up with a solution, in the end, it should also drive business success. Of course, we are advocates for users, but we are advocates for users of a certain product or of a certain service. So a solution can only be as good as it can serve that product or that service, because without the company, there would also not be any people to serve. So um, that's really what we're trying to achieve, to, to manage that middle ground. And the reality of working as a designer is that this is a very sensitive play. It's not always easy to find that middle ground. Um, and that is where design thinking comes into play or where it could help. So like I said already, um, design thinking is not something new. The principles of design thinking have been around for a long time. Um, and these principles are things like putting the user in the center, working with multidisciplinary teams, working research based, not just based on opinions, but actually making a hypothesis, doing your research, coming up with assumptions, validating them or falsifying them and using an iterative approach. What we mean with that is that we start somewhere and we keep on improving it and we keep on building up on it. So these kind of principles have been around for a long time and are not just exclusive to design thinking. So uh, to show you how that was popularized by IDEO, there is actually a really cool report available on YouTube on the IDEO shopping cart. And when you look on this video, you, you'll see that this is already pr a pretty old video. I think it came out in like the beginning of the 2000s. So that's already two decades. And here you can see how the IDEO team completely reimagines a shopping cart. So an object that many people use every day that you might think we cannot really improve that anymore. It has already reached its final form. And IDEO took the shopping cart 
observed how people go shopping in supermarkets and based on those observations they iterated the shopping cart so they came up with a new design that is more user friendly for example you can see it has crates that you can take out and move it has a scanner which at this point in time is not very revolutionary anymore but Remember, I just said this video came out like two decades ago. So back then, that was actually quite new. And so they took this approach that existed and they popularized design thinking, as they called it, to solve large business problems. So one of these things was, for example, coming up with a new shopping cart for a supermarket chain. Now, like I just said before, all of these principles, they've been around and they were not very revolutionary for designers. Like designers understand that you need to do research, that you need to put the user in the center, that you work iteratively. Those are not very revolutionary thoughts. But for non-designers, this was a very new and magical approach to problem solving, um, especially when you look at how digital solutions, how software was built before, for example, that was not iterative at all. You would just build a whole new software and then put it on the market and hope that it solves the problem of people. So that they put all of these principles in a fancy new jacket and called it design thinking for um, business people was really like, wow, this is amazing. And I'll uh, share some more thoughts on that later on. So um, what do people have to say about design thinking? I thought it would be good to start on a positive note. Let's start with what the fans think of design thinking. So um, the, the main benefit, I would say, of design thinking is that it puts the user, the customer in the center. So it focuses on a user-centered approach. What does that mean? That means that before coming up with a solution, research is done to really understand who this person is that we are designing for, that you do research to understand what are their challenges, what are the things that um, frustrate the users or that would help them, that what they seek and desire. So to build a profile around that and really grow that empathy helps you to, to solve the problems that actually matter to the user. So you really move from um, this problem definition to something that is not just a, defining the problem, but also um, defining the questions that lead up to the problem even. So another thing that um, design thinking does really well, according to the people that are proponents of design thinking, is that it is a good recipe for problem finding and solving. So it offers you some kind of um, like framework or approach or, or, or uh, steps that you can follow that make working as a designer understandable to non-designers. So how we as designers work may sometimes be very chaotic or not really understandable to people who don't share the discipline as we are, or don't share our discipline. So this design thinking kind of puts a formula on the way that we work and makes it understandable for others. And um, it also combines not only the user perspective, but also the business perspective and the technological perspective. And that, of course, for business people is really important because they also want to know how much does a solution cost and how much money will it bring us to, to like bring it all down to its core. So it combines this human point of view with what is technological, feasible, and economically viable. And then lastly, I already hinted at this, it gets non-designers excited and it gets non-designers on board. And um, that's really what IDEO did. So they popularized this for non-designers. And the interesting thing here is the word thinking, which, you know, like maybe design thinking for a designer is just called common sense or just called thinking. But uh, I think that Jared Spool makes a very good point by adding the word thinking 
next to design, you give design um, a more serious take. You turn it into something that's rational, that is not just based on making pretty pictures or not just based on opinions or people that want to make it pop more. It's really based on a um, scientific approach. So it makes um, non-designers take design more seriously and it gives them the feeling of this is something new, this is something magical. And I find that a really interesting idea that he shared there. Now, to recap, why are the things, why are why is design thinking good? Because it puts the user in the center, because it also involves non-designers and it makes non-designers understand our way of working. It combines not only the user perspective, but also the economical and technological perspective. So you might think, okay, then that all sounds really good. So what's the problem then? Why would we have any kind of critique on design, design thinking if it helps other people understand our profession better, if it helps us to put ourselves in the shoes of the user, then should all be good, right? So um, one of the main concerns that people have on design thinking is that it simplifies the design process too much. And um, this is also something that I have experienced myself when I just started out as a UX designer. I learned everything about design thinking and I thought, okay, I have my, my, my steps, you know, I have the five phases and I understand them and I know what to do in each phase and each step and I know how they follow to each other. So in theory, everything was great. I knew what to do, but the reality is that um, working as a designer is very, has a very complex iterative um, process. It can be very chaotic. It's not always just very fi um, finely outlined steps that follow up each uh, to each other. So to say that design thinking are just these five steps from building empathy to um, coming up with a prototype and testing it, that would just be simplifying it. And it gives also the impression that everyone can do this. As long as you just know the five steps of design thinking, you're good. You, you, you know what to do. This is the, the five step plan and um, it will work out. But working as a designer is actually not that simple as following five steps. So uh, as I just started the webinar with, um, design thinking is not something revolutionary or completely new, but it's something that has been around for a while and um, many things also come down to common sense. So people that are critical of design thinking, they say that it's just a fancy name for old processes. So I, uh, again, and, uh, included this quote from Jared Spoon. And on the one hand, you can use this quote as something positive, like he said here, when you add thinking to the word design, it's no longer about color or decoration, but it's about process, which you can say is a good thing. But on the other hand, that doesn't mean that it's a new thing. So it doesn't really, the, the, the design thinking approach is not something that came as a new thing to designers. They already used this approach for a long time. And I'm thinking maybe, um, I didn't include that in here, but maybe I should just iterate this for the people that are completely new to design thinking and are joining this webinar and are now thinking, but what are you talking about? I don't know what design thinking is. So um, these five steps of design thinking that I was just talking about, so here, these five steps start with the first step, which is empathize. So that's where you are going to build this understanding of your user. You're doing research, you're understanding their needs and wishes, their pains. Um, then the next step, you're going to define the problem. So what's the main issue that you want to focus on? Um, the, the main problem statement of your project or your work. Then in the next step, you're going to ideate. 
what that means is now that you better understand the problem, you're going to come up with a bunch of different solutions that could potentially solve that problem. Then in the next step, when you have come up with a bunch of different solutions, you're going to pick one to build a prototype around. And the goal of that prototype is then to later on test that with the actual users that you have interviewed and researched in the beginning. And the feedback of that testing phase will then feed into a new iteration. So um, making the solution that you have come up with better or maybe changing direction altogether because you found out through testing that it didn't work out so well as you assumed. So those are the five steps of design thinking. Just as a refresher, or if you haven't heard this before. Um, so that in itself isn't very new, like Jared Spool said. And then on top of that, and this is what Natasha Jen said um, in her quite controversial talk called Design Thinking is Bullshit. So she is very clear about her opinion on design thinking. And the reason that she says is bullshit is because, um, in her opinion, it lacks critical view. Mm. So what does that mean? It means that there is um, no evaluation from designers on the design thinking process. So there is no stage of reviewing what you're actually doing. So where is that evaluation of design happening then? Um, I would really recommend you watch this talk because she has a lot of opinions to share. And I think it's one of those videos that are really important to watch if you want to become a UX designer, just to get a different perspective. Um, I'm not entirely sure if I fully agree with her because I think that um, testing the ideas is a form of review, even though it's not reviewed by designers, but it is reviewed by users. But still, I wanted to include this because it is a video that has been around for a while that really um, brought like a different kind of perspective in the industry. So I thought it was good to add that here as well. And then you can watch it and make up your own mind on it. So uh, let's then move on to my view and use of design thinking. So um, when I just started my UX journey, obviously I heard a lot about design thinking and it was very hard for me to really grasp what this is exactly. And um, it took a while to really understand what is meant with this. Uh, to be honest, like five years later, I still like sometimes think, okay, what do we exactly mean with this term? Because it kind of became an umbrella term for everything and not nothing. Um, but back then for me, design thinking was a way to kind of like a gateway into design. So a way to grasp design basics, to learn good practices. I saw it a bit like rules to play by. So understanding, okay, research is important. Why is research important? Because research helps me define a correct problem statement. And when I have the correct problem statement, then I know what solutions to come up with. And I can test if these solutions actually solve the problem. And I understand that I need to seek that feedback from users. And I understand that my solutions are not made to be permanent, but they constantly need to improve. So I need to keep on seeking out feedback. So that is what design thinking did for me. It kind of gave me these the, the um, um, principles to, to understand how to do my work. And it also gave me kind of a feeling of control <laughs> over a chaotic work environment. Because when I just started my first UX job, I started in an agency, agencies move really fast. You do a lot of different projects in a short time frame with many different clients. Some are more receptive to design, others are less. So for me to be able to refer back to design thinking was a good way to start in this agency job and understand that, okay, I need to introduce research 
or I need to explain why we need to test or why we need to work iteratively. And it, w it was a good way for me to refer back to whenever I was talking with clients and telling them, like trying to convince them why we need to do testing. Like it was a good framework to use them. Um, nowadays, I like design thinking isn't something that um, actively shapes my daily work in the sense that I don't start my uh, work day thinking, okay, now I am now I'm in the problem space step of design thinking or now I'm in the testing phase of design thinking. That's not how I start my work anymore. It's more like a framework that is internalized. So um, when working as a product designer today, um, you have you have to work in the processes that are defined by the company. So Miro has a certain product development process that I follow, which in principle very much is like design thinking. Again, we start with research, we come up with a problem statement, we come up with different kind of solution ideas, we test them and then we um, improve them. So like I said throughout this webinar already, um, these principles are not exclusive to design thinking. They're not new for many designers. They're just common sense. So for me, this framework is now something that I just live and that kind of also gets um, shaped by whatever process the company has that I currently work for. Um, I think that design thinking is a very idealistic view on a chaotic reality. So of course, it's beautiful when design can be as easy as these five phases that follow each other in a loop and that you can always start with research and you always have time to ideate def different solutions and you have always time to test them. That of course would be an ideal world but that is not how the reality looks like. And I already noticed that during my first job working at the agency that oftentimes clients don't see the value of research or they don't have time or money to invest in research or they have a deadline and things need to be done really fast. Like I've worked on projects where basically you go from scratch to an app in a week and then obviously there is not much time for research or testing things so the reality can be very chaotic and fast-paced and that is i think my personal biggest um critique to design thinking is that it's just an like a very good theoretical framework but it's just not really how the reality looks like so um that yeah that what what does help me then in my daily work is to um understand how products are made in my company so now recently have joined Miro I try to understand what is their cadence of developing features or building a product what role does research play in there do they have a lot of time for research or is there less time for research do we test things a lot or not? So I try to just understand like within the um, system of this company, how are products built? What role can I play as a designer? And I, I find that design thinking principles seep back into that, but it's not a very hard frame. So it's not like I need to do research Otherwise, I can't move to testing. I, in reality, it's oftentimes like you join a project that has already been going for a while. And so research has been done by someone else. So you don't have to do that anymore or you can't do that anymore. Or you're working on a project that is then handed over to another designer who will be responsible for coming up with the solutions and the prototypes and testing it. So 
you also kind of move through these different phases. You're not, you don't always start from one to five. Sometimes you start on step three to four. So um, I think design thinking after all is more than just a process. It's not really um, like I said, a framework that you have to see so black and white and that you really have to hold on to because um, like I said, the reality looks very different. So for me, design thinking is more a mindset that helps me frame my work in a user-centric way. So what feeds into design thinking for me are uh, is common sense. Obviously, we need to test our work before we put it out on the market. Uh, a part is also intuition. And I feel like we don't talk enough about that in design because we're very aware that as UX designers and product designers, you need to research things and validate them and test them. And all of that is true. And I definitely stand behind that. But I think there is also a big part that is just your intuition as a designer that comes with experience and that should not be underestimated. Sometimes you just also know how to do things because you've done them many times before and you've tested them many times before. And that kind of feeds into your design experience or like your design eye or however you want to call it. So apart from intuition and common sense, I think design thinking also is dependent on the processes defined by the company, like I just said. So at Miro, we have a certain product development process, but at Zalando, there was also a product development process and they might be called different. They might have a few more or a few less steps, but in the end, they're all, they all come down to the same thing, which is what I just described, moving from research to a well-defined problem, exploring that, testing that, and taking that feedback into the next solution. And then uh, one thing which I'm not an expert on, but I think it's really important. And if there is one thing that you uh, take from this webinar today and that you do an extra Google search on, then I hope it's agile product development because I found that understanding how other teams build products, so non-design teams build products, made me understand better what my role as a designer also is. So in the agencies I worked at, but also now at Miro, we use a what they call agile work uh, product development. And you have many different names for this, which you will find when you Google it, you have like lean, agile, like all these buzzwords. I also don't know exactly all the differences between them, but um, it also comes down to an iterative product process. So an iterative way of building small things, putting them out, testing them, building upon them and understanding how engineers work, that they probably follow some kind of agile process. That really helped me understood, understand things better because as a designer, um, you know, I can say, hey, I have this amazing design thinking process and we should all follow the design thinking process. But there are also a ton of disciplines that don't use this and that don't even know this. And they just call it agile or whatever they want to call it. So to understand how other disciplines build and work, that was really, really helpful for me. And I found that, you know, many of these things, again, are built on the same principle. So it's not like it's completely new. Um, but that led me to the, to the conclusion that design thinking for me is not just a, it's not a hardcore process, but it's more like a mindset that is shaped by many different things. So um, 
I already kind of like alluded this before because it made a bit more sense in my story before, but as a recap, so what are these five phases of design thinking? If you look them up, you have empathize. So that's where you do lots of research. Then you have define, that's where you synthesize and analyze all your research insights to come up with a problem statement. Then you ideate, so collaboratively together with many different disciplines in your team, you arrive at this problem definition. You then um, explore different concept solutions out of which a prototype grows. So you work from very rough solutions, what we call low fidelity, to very polished designs, high fidelity. Then you can test this prototype and you have to test it with enough users, of course, to make sure that the feedback you get is not just a single person's opinion, but actually a pattern. So um, that's how, in theory, this all should work. But as I said, the reality looks a little bit different. So the reality looks a bit like this. And I, I really tried to just map kind of like a an, the, the development of an average project for me, which is very hard to do because every project is different. But in general, what uh, I found was that Whenever I start a new project, I do a little bit of research and I check previous research because of course there is, when you're joining a company, a ton of research done before you and you don't always have to reinvent the wheel. There might be insights that are also valuable to your project. So I do a bit of research, check what has been done previously, then, and this um, I personally find is very important to do my job good, which is to check with internal objectives. So what is the business trying to accomplish? Like, are we trying to grow our user base? Are we wanting to build new features? Do we want to pivot into a different direction altogether? Do we want to bring out new products or services on the market? So I do a lot of um, research on what the company wants to understand. I read company strategy, the company vision, and treat my colleagues or stakeholders as kind of like internal users that I also need to understand. When I have done all of that, I synthesize and I analyze all of this insights that I've gotten. And then I check work that has been done before. So again, like your work in a company is never standalone. You work in a system where other designers have maybe worked on the same problem before as well. So I check what these people have done before. And then more often than not, I go straight to final designs. I don't really sketch much on paper, not as much as I would love to. And as I think is right, because you have time pressure Nowadays, with a design system, you have a lot of ready-made components, so you might also not need to start with pen on paper, even though I highly encourage it. Then, um, when I'm lucky, I get to test my solution with a few users, but it also happens that I cannot test it because, again, time and money problems. I might join a completely other project, in the meantime, so I don't even see the results of the test. I don't really know what will happen with the rest of the work because I'm now working on something else. I join this other process. I skip research because there is no time or there is no budget. I iterate on the designs that colleagues already made before. So a lot of the work and the thinking has been done for me. I'm testing this new design because maybe this time there is the opportunity to do that. And then I might move to another project again. So as you can see, what I hoped to do with this is to kind of show you the, the reality of like, you're constantly moving in and out of projects. A company is moving, you know, different kind of parts, different priorities, different teams and resources. So, um, to really follow 
this five step thing is quite a luxury that doesn't really happen that many times. Um, this is more how my work has looked like in the past five years. I personally don't think this is a nightmare, even though showing you this, you might think, oh, so that means I can never properly do my work. I can never do my work as I'm supposed to do because I cannot do right research or I cannot do testing properly. But for me, that is what makes this role so exciting. It's you're, you're moving as a designer into a team and you have to educate them on design processes. So you have to try and move towards something like this. Um, and you have to also balance the daily challenges that come to your way. And that is what makes the job so varied. And that's what makes um, the job so exciting because you learn so many things. So even though this might look a little bit intimidating uh, or off-putting maybe even, I personally don't see it like that at all. I think it's more like a challenge for us as designers to really bring design practices to non-designers. And that is that is a very real challenge that all designers deal with. And it's one that I think is very exciting and something that you have to be aware of before you become a UX designer, because it's very likely that you will move into a company where people don't really know what you're doing and why you're there. And so you have to explain that to them. So, okay, what does all of this mean for you before you get really depressed and think, oh my God, so what now? Like, is it even a point in becoming a UX designer if I cannot live design thinking? Like, what should I do now? It's all not that dramatic. So um, to recap, still use design thinking, but use it as, like I said, a mindset. Use it as guiding principles because there are a lot of things in there that people actually use. They might not call it design thinking, but it's still very much um, the way that we work. So use it as a, as a reminder to do research, to put the users in the center, see it as a communication tool for non-designers, you see it as a way to focus on problem definition, see it as a way to experiment and test, let users contribute. So always include the voice of your users literally through interviewing them or through testing your solutions with them and work iteratively. I see that I doubled this. Um, see it as something that is extra important to use this as a communication tool. And um, what can your next steps be now? So like you're, you're leaving this webinar now, what are the next steps? First of all, I would say learn the theory because even when the practice doesn't look exactly like the theory, it's still good to understand how things theoretically work. Just that does not apply to design thinking alone. That applies to many different things. So understand why we have these different five phases in design thinking, why they're important, and understand the theory behind them. Because then you can also more easily understand when the practice looks different from the theory and you better understand like how to navigate that. So um, there is actually a whole like beginner's guide on CF on oh, sorry career foundry on uh, design thinking which maybe someone can post a link of that in the chat it's like that's basically all the theory that you need to know and then to to balance that out with navigating the reality I would read a book on uh, how products are developed for example lean UX that is a really great book that teaches you how you can work with agile teams. And that kind of gives you the two perspectives. So the theory of design thinking with how products are actually built. And then, and this, I put it last, but that is actually the most important thing. 
And I think this applies to anything that you learn about design. Make up your own mind. I think that's really important as a UX designer to keep on asking questions, to keep on wondering why, to keep your curiosity, do your research. Don't just assume something because someone in a webinar said this, like go out and combine, you know, what you read with what you experience, start discussions with your design peers and make up your own thoughts on this. Um, so to recap all of what I just said, if you forget everything else that I've just told you, then please remember this. Design is very complex and there is not one truth. There is not one right way to design. There are many different ways and they might share the same underlying principles, but the, the challenge and at the same time also the cool thing about design is that it's not like mathematics. We don't have hard formulas that are always true. It's more like a, a combination of experience with process, with other people's experience. And um, in the end, we're all just making educated guesses. So uh, please just learn do your research, see different perspectives, find what works for you. As I, as I hope I could have shown you is that even though I cannot apply everything from design thinking in my work, it still is a good foundation for me. There are still things that I take that work for me. Um, and what has helped me the most to progress as a designer is to really seek out these different perspectives and to um, especially seek out the perspectives of people I do not agree with at all, because that might teach you something new. So I want to leave it um, with this. I need to drink something because I'm out of breath. But at the same time, um, I'm going to just hand it over to Well, because I'm sure some people might have some questions. Hi Maureen, grab a drink, grab a drink please. <laughs> um, thanks everyone for watching Maureen, thank you so much for presenting um, this evening. There are some great questions from the audience on Big Marker, we will get to those firstly, but um, Maureen, a question from me first, um, because I know that you originally studied art history back in the day, mm -hmm. and what inspired you uh, to, to look for a career in design or UX design specifically? Um, well, I had a I had a very concrete inspiration, which was that my dad told me I should become a UX designer. <laughs> and I decided after a while to listen to him, and I'm very grateful for that. But the, um, the reason was that I, I studied art history and I really liked that, but I didn't want to work in the art world because that was just not really, I, I, I didn't really see myself working there. And so I worked in marketing for a while, but I really missed the connection with the people that would actually use the product because I felt like I was always working on campaigns without knowing who would actually use the product. And that's how I uh, came to UX design in the end. Awesome, awesome. Why did you first hear about UX design? Was it uh, through a blog or was it a podcast or...? Um, yeah, no, it's like I said, that was my, actually my dad who told me like, have you heard, I, no, he actually said, have you heard about design thinking and have you heard about UX design? And then I started Googling and um, yeah, at the time there weren't that many resources yet as there are now. So I think that the Career Foundry blog was probably one of the first that I found with information about this. And that's how I just did my research. Awesome. I'm just going to jump into the questions on Big Marker. Um, I think Ingrid's got a great, a great question here. Can someone that comes from a leading position in marketing design go straight into a leading role in product design, or are those two complete different roles? I find that hard to answer. Uh, I've I've seen this discussion many times where people try to immediately get to a, a lead role in UX design. I think if you come from a lead role, you already know that with a certain seniority, it's not just the knowledge, but it's even more so can you 
manage stakeholders? Can you manage um, different kind of expectations? Can you mentor other people? Are you someone that can, that can lead projects on their own? So I think those are all things that you should keep and in, like take into account. I that's the reason why I did not pursue lead roles immediately because it's not just about the hard skills. Actually, those really don't matter. Like you can learn Figma. Everyone can teach you how to use Figma. It's more about can you defend design decisions? Can you uh, pursue like um, um, convince your stakeholders of a certain concept? Can you mentor junior designers? And that are the things, those are the things that you need to feel comfortable with if you want to become a lead product designer or lead UX designer, because those will be your tasks. The tasks will probably not be plan a user interview or, you know, like come up with wireframes because that's not in your responsibility at that level anymore. I think I've also seen on LinkedIn too, I think Maureen, you also touched upon this subject as well, is that, um, you know, I think positions also look very different in different companies, also depending on what stage the company is, you know, a startup versus a multinational. Um, so, you know, sometimes the job descriptions can also look very different and also the career path might not be linear. So you might be jumping from a mid-level to a senior, um, you know, to a lead, but then your next position might be, you know, mid-level again or something. Yeah, that's that's literally how my career has looked like. So I um, now currently at Miro, I'm a product designer. But previously I, at Zalando, I was a senior product designer, but I started as a product designer. And at the agency I worked at before Zalando, I was a senior. So it really depends on how the company defines these different roles. And for me, I I don't really put so much value in it. Like if it's senior or lead, it's more for me about what the role actually entails. But that is also just a personal consideration that people can make for themselves. For sure. Also, Maureen mentioned the Career Foundry blog. I'm just going to drop that, um, the UX section in the chat. Um, do check out that. We've got a lot of um, editors in-house who are writing articles. Um, so there's a lot of content over there. Um, there's some more specific articles, but there's also some very um, uh, you know, entry level articles too. Uh, another great question specifically about um, design thinking um, from Lionel. How does the iterative nature of design thinking foster innovation and problem solving in various industries? Oh, I like that question. I think it's because when you work iteratively, you keep your mind open to new input that might come to you through testing or through continuous research or through customer feedback. And because you keep your mind open and you're not focused on just one solution, you can also come up with new kind of solutions that might, might be more innovative. So for example, like now, of course, everyone is obsessed with AI, but that is because when you keep an open mind about, for example, these new technologies, you can also think about, okay, how can we um, use these new technologies in a way that makes sense in our products or our services? So I think that's why the, the iterative approach, what it really means is keeping an open mind. And keeping an open mind is what I think leads to innovation or getting different perspectives in also. Great answer. Um, linking to that question, uh, Bizola, also apologies if I pronounce anyone's uh, name wrong, Bizola is asking, how do you best follow the design thinking process when working in collaboration with other design team members such as UX writers? I think, uh, yeah, that's a good question also. I think um, that's why I don't see design thinking as a hard process, but more as a mindset that I use for myself, because not every discipline that you will meet on the work floor knows about design thinking and you still need to work together with them. So the best way to collaborate with people is to understand how they are working. And 
there you can actually apply the put the user in the center mindset by putting your colleague in the center and understanding how do they work what are their challenges if you're working with a ux writer what are they trying to achieve and find a way of working that works for the both of you and you can draw inspiration from design thinking but maybe there are other processes but um that's why i think it's not very productive to hold on to design thinking as this dogmatic guide that always has to work and that you always have to apply because sometimes it, it, it doesn't apply or sometimes you know other things might be better for collaboration great answer don't get too hooked on one thing yeah exactly uh, yeah. um Devis is also asking a great um, question. I think, especially for you working in the industry for a long time, um, how do you get useful feedback on your work? Um, if in real companies, you don't see the final result of your effort due to all the fragmentation in the workflow. Yeah, that's, uh, that's actually something that I uh, like experience constantly. For example, working at Miro, there are so many different teams and we're working on so many different things and I might start something but I might not have the opportunity to drive it all the way to the end because I moved to a different project or I might move to a completely different team or whatever and so that's where I think it's really important to um, work transparently so what I mean with that is keep sharing your work keep um, asking different people for feedback involve people from different teams, from different projects, share your work with them so that you kind of understand what everyone is working on and what that leads to and how it will look like when it's live and celebrate these new achievements with each other. If you have a new feature that goes live, like we also celebrate that together in Miro, not just the person that designed that one thing. So yeah, I think Transparency is very important there, just to make sure that you know what other people are working on. Also, for anyone who, out there, because I know we've got a very mixed audience this evening, uh, and there's probably also beginners in the audience too, um, Miro is a fantastic collaborative um, platform where you can uh, design, uh, you can have host meetings, uh, you can put a lot of virtual post-it notes all over the place. Um, so do check out Miro. I think somewhere on the Career Foundry blog, if you type in Career Foundry and Mirror somewhere, um, I'm sure there's a link and uh, also some great content, I think on the Career Foundry YouTube channel, uh, specifically about Miro. So I'm just gonna shamelessly plug uh, Miro as well. Um, that's where Maureen's currently working. But jumping back into the Q&A, some great questions. Thank you so much for all the great questions this evening. Um, let's have a look at uh, a very specific question from Mike. Um, I love the last slide. There is no one truth, but some big businesses will look for one truth and one way to do things and push to cut corners where possible to hurry along the process. Do you have any advice for those of us that work in companies that aren't comfortable with agile working? Consulting mode, Maureen. I wonder how many companies actually work agile, but that is a completely different story. Um, so I think that is one of the most important parts of working as a designer and one of the most difficult and challenging ones is to um, explain your design de decisions. And so if you're working with someone that just wants one truth, um, what I try to do is use as many research findings that I've had that I've gathered try to test as much, much as I can or draw insights from similar tests that have been done by other teams if there are if there's no budget to do your own test and really try to um, present like argument argument your design decision right you have to um, sell that to others you have to explain to them this is what our users said this is why this solution, is the one that's easiest to build for the engineers. This is the reason how it will um, support the company strategy or vision the best. So really try to um, come up with as many arguments for your decisions and talk in the language of your stakeholders. 
So if you know that the stakeholder is someone that, you know, they, they don't understand much of design, they just want to have, but they do understand a lot about data or they, they, they want to save costs or whatever it is that they try to achieve, try to frame your work in those words that resonate with them. This solution will help us grow with X amount of users per month or this solution will help us save money because blah, blah, blah. So I think um, that's it. Like, yeah, it's, it, there there is no one truth in design and therefore you have to build very strong arguments why your design is the right one. And you do that through research. Have you ever launched a design and you expect customers to interact with it in a certain way? And then the customers are not interacting in a certain way. And then you send out some a survey and then you're expecting some answers and there's different answers. And then you're just like, oh my God, why? For sure. I mean, like now when we work at Miro, there are a lot of different features and we're trying to get users to use them. But sometimes they are not as well received as we hoped, or maybe the people find it hard to find these features or start using them. So of course you then wonder like, what can I do better? But before, whenever I would get like negative user feedback on a solution, it would be very demotivating for me because you spend so much time thinking on the solution and you are really convinced that it is a really good solution and then your users are just not feeling it. But nowadays I actually get really happy when I'm in a test or an user interview and someone is like, oh, this really does not work for me. I really don't understand this because those strong opinions, that's what actually makes your work better. And that's what, then you really learn something new and then you really know where you can improve. And for me, what really helped me arrive at that mindset was to realize that as a designer in this space, my designs are just communication tools. They're not made to be permanent. Like the thing I designed today is irrelevant tomorrow. That's how fast this industry moves. So if I want to make something that's permanent, I should have stayed in the art world. So that is why it's easier for me to just accept feedback from users because th that's how the thing will be more valuable to them. And for me, design is just a, like a way to yeah, communicate those ideas, but it's not an art piece. For sure. And for anyone watching this evening uh, who may be interested in design thinking, is just starting out uh, in UX design. Um, our Career Foundry's UX design program is broken down to three parts. We've got the intro, then we've got immersion. And in immersion, there's a whole section uh, dedicated to design thinking. If you've got any questions about the curriculum, I'll just post a link to uh, the program advisor so you can book a call with one of our program advisors and you can ask any questions about the curriculum or the mentorship that um, Career Foundry offers. And one other thing I want to share with the audience is that we were recently in New York and we interviewed another um, Career Foundry UX design graduate, uh, Sheridan Baker, who's currently living and working in New York, New York a design agency and just posting that uh, YouTube link there so you can check out um, Sheridan's interview. Um, also, uh, feel free to drop it a like uh, because I know that you, our YouTube team are watching in the background and they will absolutely love uh, additional likes, so um, do that. Just jumping quickly back into the q and I am mindful of the time. Um, Elena is asking, what do you think non-designer stakeholders care most about? Because sometimes it seems the only important part is to be able to come up with tons of ideas. Well, I think the, the, then you already have a win when they are up for listening to many different ideas. That's good and better than when they don't want to even want to listen. Um, so what was an important lesson for me to learn here was to understand what is important to my internal stakeholders. And that is why I think it's really important to understand what a business is trying to achieve because your non-designer colleagues, they might understand that the customer is important, but they have other targets. You know, they want to um, build something that is fast and easy to build, for example. It might not be the thing that 
users truly want. So learn how to speak their language by learning how to understand what are the business objectives, what are the things that your non-design colleagues are trying to achieve. Interview them as you would interview a user, like, hey, what, what are you trying to achieve? What is your team trying to achieve? What are the next big milestones on your roadmap? How can I support? So those are literally the questions I ask whenever I'm working with new people. And that really helps to work together with them because that way, you know, like when you talk with someone and they feel like you're understanding them, it's easier to then also introduce some of the ideas that you think are important. So like, hey, maybe we should do some more research because then we can help you achieve your goal as well. So kind of like, yeah, see your non-design colleagues as users as well, I think is the, the short answer to that. Take, take pity on your non-design colleagues. You know, we're kind as well. We, exactly. we've, got, we've got great ideas, but we just, we just find it difficult. Um, AJT has got a great question on portfolios. I think we'll end on portfolios because mm -hmm. also it's a key takeaway. And uh, Maureen, I know that you're an expert on portfolios too. Um, let me jump into this. A question from someone who's currently working on her first portfolio. I appreciate the honesty of what your design process actually looks like versus what is being taught in schools courses. I understand it's important to know how to do paper wireframes, low fidelity prototypes. Do you think that's still worth highlighting when applying for work? Or do you think it's enough that it's included in my portfolio, but not worth mentioning during the interview slash presentation? Um, I think I, I found that people oftentimes ask what they want to see in your interview, but I think wireframes and the low fidelity work is the most important thing in your portfolio because sure, the, the fancy visuals, that's what drives people into your case study in the beginning, or that's what piques people's interest, but all the ugly designs and the rough sketches and the things where you have to do everything five times again. That's where you can see how someone is thinking and what someone is deciding on and the different challenges that you're working through. So I would say um, that is really important to show. And I always, whenever I review someone's portfolio and they only show the final work, I'm like, yeah, sure. But how do you arrive there? It's not the what comes out in the end. It's the how do you get there that people want to understand. So I would um, um, definitely make sure I have this on hand so that when people ask during the interview, you can um, show that to them. I think what's most important in these interviews is to show the people how you're thinking. And there really isn't a right or wrong answer here. The wrong, the most wrong answer that you can give is something like, I created a persona because my bootcamp said I needed to make a persona. Or I created a persona um, because that's what you do when you do design thinking. Like that's, no, you, you have to explain why you're making something. and. If it doesn't make sense to you, then don't show it because you have to be able to defend these decisions. So I think, um, yeah, the, the, the rough work is is um, a good tool to show that that thinking process that goes inside of you. For sure. And for any beginners watching, portfolios are um, absolutely crucial when it comes to the interview process. And the great thing about portfolio um, I will plug the Career Foundry program because it's the key takeaway, but the great thing about it is that you've put together um, a group of projects that you've worked on, you've done them from scratch through to finish, and when you're in the interview stage, you can walk through the project and really explain how you put this together. So not just showing it, it's not a, in some ways it's not a piece of art that we're looking at and trying to interpret, we actually want to know the steps that you took to make that portfolio. And that's the key to getting you a job in the industry. So it's really, uh, portfolio is really key. And uh, if you get mental support, um, it's a lot of help because you'll get a lot of great pointers um, along the way. I am mindful of the time, Maureen. We have gone a little bit over. Uh, great questions from the audience this evening. Thank you so, so much. I'm just gonna skip on, I'm gonna share these slides tomorrow, don't worry.
I know I'm going to show the slides. You're going to get an email tomorrow with the recording, uh, with slides, and um, a few more links uh, from me too. Uh, one thing I would say is that we are currently offering a 20% discount off our UX design program. So on Big Market, I've added a little sticky note. Uh, just click there if you want to get the 20% off. And also um, on YouTube, uh, if you click below in the description there, you can book a call with the program advisor or also get the discount. Um, or ask any questions that you may have about Career Foundry or any of the programs that we offer. One last thing I wanted to do uh, and share, I know I've shared, I've shared a lot of stuff this evening, but um, you know, it's just how it's rolling tonight. But for anyone who's not quite ready to jump on board, uh, we do also offer a free short course, um, which is like an intro to UX design itself. It covers like five or six days. So if you wanna uh, start dealing with some of the topics like design thinking, um, or wireframing, um, I would uh, recommend signing up for the free short course. And um, that's everything. Maureen, thank you so much for taking the time uh, to speak to us this evening. I know it's been a while since we've done one of these, and I feel like we should do. I feel like we should do some more because and some different topics. So I felt so too. It was a bit like, oh my god, I'm I'm doing a webinar again. How does this go again? But I really liked it. I always really like the questions of the audience. They're always really great uh, questions and I find it a shame we had not time for answering all of them but I think um, a new webinar is coming up in December so then people have their chance to ask a question again if it's not answered yeah um, true true check out the events page um, I don't think that webinar's up yet but it will be up soon um, and uh, we will we will be taking more questions okay um maureen have a good evening in amsterdam and um i will see you next time thank you so much see you then uh, thanks bye -bye. maureen thanks thanks everyone in the audience too great questions